the Institute of National Affairs. Um, this week we're celebrating the 200th anniversary of the Bill of Rights. And tonight um, speaking is Howard Zinn. He's a professor emeritus of Boston University. Um, he's written various books and articles on history and law. Um, Mr. Zinn, would you like to? Well, he'll talk for a while and then there'll be questions afterwards. Well, thank you for inviting me to Iowa. I don't get too many invitations to Iowa. <laughs> and where I do get invitations, I only get invited once. <laughs> that should tell me something, shouldn't it? Um, so I'm going to talk about the Bill of Rights. And uh, we have just celebrated, except that Iowa is still celebrating. Don't pay any attention to the calendar. The 200th anniversary of the Bill of Rights. And we seem to have a bicentennial almost every year of something, which makes sense since every year is 200 years after something. <laughs> so uh, here we are celebrating the Bill of Rights. And the trouble with celebrations and the trouble with bicentennials is that people get carried away and they uh, get <laughs> Maybe you haven't been, but <laughs> I can see somebody looking and say, I haven't been carried away. <laughs> but there are, there are people who are carried away and get off into very romantic flights about the thing which is being celebrated. And, and they give the thing which is being celebrated uh, an importance and, uh, you know, that, and uh, the kind of status which uh, may be exaggerated. Uh, well, for instance, uh, the, during the bicentennial in 1987, it was the bicentennial of the framing of the Constitution, uh, and uh, an essay was written on it by President Ronald Reagan. I, do you know that President Reagan wrote essays? <laughs> uh, he, uh, this is an essay for a scholarly publication, naturally. Parade Magazine, <laughs> and, uh, and Reagan was writing about the Constitution, which really got him into a, a great glow. And he said, I, I can't help but marvel at the genius of our founders. They created with a sureness and originality so great and pure that I can't help but perceive the guiding hand of God. I had to stop there, and I thought, you mean God <laughs> was there in Philadelphia? Uh, that, and that God chose our Constitution? But this was sort of typical of Reagan, you know, we are the chosen. God chose, God is always with us. And, uh, and then he, he goes on to say, the first political system that insisted that, flow, that power flows from the people to the state, not the other way around. And it's, an, it's a noble thought. Uh, he uttered this just at the time that the Iran-Contra affair was <laughs> unfolding. And when it, it did not look at that time as if in this political system power flowed from the people to the state. In fact, it looked at this time as if the state were exercising power behind the backs of the American people and the people didn't know anything about it. But, it, you know, in, in the bicentennial years, people are given to rhetorical flights and they do get carried away. And Reagan was often carried away. And, uh, so here we are with, with 200 years of the Bill of Rights. And I guess I'm cautioning us, uh, myself, I guess, as well as you, that while the Bill of Rights is, is a noble document, just as, you know, uh, and it has some wonderful things in it, to me the greatest danger of celebrating the Bill of Rights without thinking hard about it, uh, 
is that it may create too great a dependence on the words of the Bill of Rights. That is, uh, this is, a, I think, a, a common problem in the age of literacy, and that is we take words very, very seriously. We think if something is written down, that it must be true. And that if it says Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech, it means really that Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech. Uh, and so I'm, I'm asking that we, we take a, a look at the Bill of Rights in a, what I think is a sober and uh, realistic way and understand <coughs> that the rights that we have won in this country, and there have been rights won in this country, there are still rights not yet won, important rights not yet won. But yes, some rights have been won in this country, but where they have been won, in general, that has not come about simply as a result of words in the Constitution, words in the Bill of Rights, laws passed by Congress, presidents being elected, not as a result of the, the, the people going through the channels, uh, people going through the, the regularized institutional processes of government, the things written down on paper, the graphs and charts, the, the flow, the checks and balances, the, all those things that they put on the blackboard when you're taking civics and they show you the, the three branches of government and they show you how neat it all is and how one branch of government will, will, well, if somebody does something wrong, the other branch of government will take care of it. And that's what checks and balances is all about. Well, historically, uh, this is not what has happened. Um, the, the, most, the most obvious example of that is the history of black people in this country and the history of racial equality and the struggle for racial equality in this country. Uh, the Constitution, you may recall, enshrined slavery. The Constitution recognized slavery, legitimized slavery. We didn't have slavery because there was a constitution. We had slavery for a long time before there was a constitution. We didn't need words to legitimize slavery. The state of Maryland legalized slavery decades after it was a fact. Slavery became uh, what, what was an economic and political and psychological fact before it was written into law. And then when slavery was done away with in the United States, it was not done away with you may recall, by the normal processes of representative government. Uh, and it was done away with, not, oh, not just by a civil war, but by, because a civil war in itself conceivably might not have done away with slavery were it not for the fact that there arose in this country in, in the years between 1830 and 1860 a great social movement, the anti-slavery movement, the abolitionist movement, that uh, the, that movement, uh, starting with a sort of handful of, of despised and harassed and beaten and murdered people, uh, that movement grew into, into a great national phenomenon so that by the time the, the country was at war, there was a, a power in the country which insisted that emancipation take place. After all, emancipation did not take place at the onset of the war. Uh, Lincoln, Lincoln did not immediately go ahead with the Emancipation Proclamation. It took several years before Lincoln decided on the Emancipation Proclamation. And, uh, and it, it, was, it took a, a huge amount of agitation, and plus military necessity, plus practical need to bring about the Emancipation Proclamation, and it took a great movement on the, in the country uh, by this time uh, to create the pressures that led to the passage of the 13th Amendment and then the 14th and the 15th Amendments. And finally, the, 14th, the 13th Amendment doing away with slavery and the 14th and 15th Amendment uh, 
appearing to grant equal rights to all people regardless of race or color, or previous condition of servitude, uh, etc. But if you remember some or have read some of your American history, uh, well, you know that the 14th and 15th Amendments were dead. That if there was written to the 14th Amendment that no, no person shall be denied equal protection of the laws, but all over this country black people were denied the equal protection of the laws for a hundred years. No person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, but that was happening to black people. Uh, according to the 14th Amendment, the, represent, the representation of states in Congress could be cut down by the president if they did not give blacks the right to vote. There's a, a little part of the 14th Amendment which is very little noticed. No president in the United States invoked the 14th Amendment. No president, conservative or liberal, Republican or Democrat, from uh, Andrew Johnson all the way up through Franklin Roosevelt and past Franklin Roosevelt. Not until the 1960s did we begin to get uh, the 14th Amendment enforced in a serious way. And then not because Congress passed a law, but because, well, as you know, having lived through that era, uh, a great movement took place in this country, the Civil Rights Movement, which shook the country, excited the country, embarrassed the government and led to, yes, led to new congressional legislation and led to, to the reality of racial segregation, of legal racial segregation being done away. So my, my point, of course, in, in this is simply to point to the fact that, uh, well, as always, the situation of black people is a clue to the situation of, every, of everybody else. Just situation of women is a clue to the situation of everybody else. Just as a clue, the situation of prisoners that is, in order to get some insight into a situation of yours which uh, may be uh, resistant to sort of r real understanding, it's sometimes necessary to look at the situation of people who are really up against it. And their situation very often gives you a clue to what may otherwise not be uh, revealed in your own situation. So black people, the history of black people is not just the history of black people, it's the history of everybody in some different form. Uh, you, so it was struggle, as Frederick Douglass said, you know, sort of great words of Frederick Douglass, struggle, struggle, endless struggle uh, that brought about whatever modicum of justice black people were able to win in this country. Although it was in the Constitution. The words of the Constitution, 14th and 15th Amendments, were clear. It didn't matter until blacks took to the streets. There's another area of, uh, of rights, of justice, where there isn't anything in the Constitution, really. That is, I'm talking about economic rights. We don't, we don't normally, when we think of a Bill of Rights, when we think of rights, we think of those rights we have learned to think of as rights. As we, they're rights that, that we've learned. Well, these are rights, speech, press, religion, assembly, petition, right to counsel, right to, you know, the rights of the Bill of Rights. And, and it, it hasn't occurred to us, and it, it always catches us surprised when somebody says, well, why isn't there written into the Constitution the right to health care for everybody, the right to education for everybody, the right to housing for everybody, the right to food for everybody. In other words, an economic bill of rights. Uh, we in the United States are not accustomed to think that way. Well, a lot of people in the world are not accustomed to think that way, but we in a, particularly have been so concentrated on the political rights of the bill of rights. Uh, there's nothing in the bill of rights which guarantees to people that they shouldn't be forced to work 12 hours or 16 hours a day. And in this country, in the development of the economy of this country in, in that, uh, yes, that great period of the 19th century, which is referred to in all the uh, history books, you know, the, the Gilded Age, the age of industry, you know, the Industrial Revolution, uh, when America became a, a great economic power. I mean, that was a period 
that noble, great, wonderful period was a period when people worked 12, 14, 16 hours a day. When girls went into the textile mills in New England and at the age of 12 and died at the age of 25, when workers worked on the railroads and on the mines and died by the thousands in the heat and the cold, and uh, people worked long hours for very little pay. There was nothing in the Constitution to protect them. And how did they get the eight-hour day? They didn't get it because Congress passed a law, although eventually Congress passed a law. But the eight-hour day began to be one in the mid-19th uh, century, in the 1870s, 1880s, when workers, with no constitutional protection at all, just organized themselves into trade unions and went on strike and engaged in boycotts and used their economic power and demanded that their hours of work be cut from 16 to 12 to 10 to 8 hours. No constitutional protection. No words in the Constitution. Just the organized activity of large numbers of people determined to secure justice for themselves. Makes you wonder about that relationship between words on paper and citizen action, popular struggle. Women's rights, nothing in the Constitution really. Well, sure, the 19th Amendment was passed and the right to vote, which gave women that tremendous opportunity that we all have to vote for either a Democrat or a Republican. And I don't want to demean the right to vote. Uh, someday it will mean something. Uh, someday we will really make good use of it. But, uh, so, yeah, that was written into the Constitution. But the other rights of women, the rights of women to be considered as human beings, the rights of women of their own, over their own bodies, the rights of women to be uh, considered as equals, that did not come about because Congress passed laws, although there too eventually Congress passed laws. Congress passes laws, the Supreme Court makes decisions, not in the initiation of a new situation, but in recognition of a new situation. And uh, <coughs> there was uh, a women's movement that developed in this country in the 1960s and 1970s. Well, just as the, 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 the right to vote did not come as a result of Congress suddenly waking up one day and deciding it would be a just thing to do to give women the right to vote. No, it came as a result of a tremendous women's movement in the early part of the 20th century. Uh, and then in the 19, late 60s and 70s, a women's movement arose in this country. And the Supreme Court decision, Roe versus Wade, and the development of affirmative action and all of that was in good part the result of that, that new consciousness that developed in this country. Uh, so, Maybe I'm uh, arguing this point too strenuously. But I guess uh, I'm arguing it strenuously in order to uh, really try to emphasize the fact that we very often become dependent on words on paper, on voting, on Congress, on, on saviors, on people there in Washington who, is, who are going to save us when we're in trouble. The Founding Fathers saved us and Abraham Lincoln saved the, the black people and Franklin Roosevelt saved the poor, you know, and, and somebody will save us. But that's not how things happen historically. Uh, people get saved when they organize to save themselves and when they create the kind of commotion that then causes the people who lead the country to begin to think twice about what they're doing and maybe then to pass new laws and make new decisions. Uh, and those people who urge, well, you know, go through the proper channels are people who are urging you to, into a maze to get lost. Uh, in the, in the, during the days of slavery, <coughs> William Lloyd Garrison, the, the fiery anti-slavery agitator in Boston, uh, was writing the, you know, these very powerful editorials 
in, in the Liberator and the anti-slavery magazine and a friend of his wrote to him now you know please take it easy you know you're too ex you know excited you know and and we we must go through the regular mechanisms of you know etc cetera, etc cetera. you've heard that many times probably anybody who's tried to do anything <laughs> is outside of the norm is told no you must go do the proper Garrison replied to his friend slavery sir that's the way they used to talk to one another in those days <laughs> slavery sir will not be overthrown without excitement a tremendous excitement that's what it takes. So now let me talk about the First Amendment uh, of the Bill of Rights. Um, and uh, talk about how that fits into the construct which I've just tried to lay out about the relationship between words and, and reality. Uh, I think I, I think I first became acutely aware of this when I was teaching a course in constitutional law, and I suppose teaching a traditional course in constitutional law. A traditional course in constitutional law is a course in which you read Supreme Court decisions. I mean, that's what constitutional law is. Uh, you read Supreme Court decisions because the Supreme Court is interpreting the Constitution and so uh, the Constitution means whatever the Supreme Court has recently said it means. So that's, so that's what I was teaching. But I, it was my first teaching job. My, my first teaching job was in the South, in Atlanta, Georgia. My first real teaching job. I had a number of unreal teaching jobs before that. Uh, my first real teaching job was teaching at uh, Spelman College, which is a black women's college. At that time, they called it a Negro college. Black women's college in Atlanta, Georgia. And uh, it was a time of the civil rights movement. I taught there for seven years, and it was just those years uh, between the Montgomery bus boycott and the Birmingham demonstrations of 1963. Uh, and uh, I became involved in uh, the, what we call the movement. My students became involved. And uh, one day, some of the students, you have to understand that Atlanta at that time, by 1960, late 50s, 1960. Atlanta was as tightly segregated as, you know, Johannesburg, South Africa. Uh, Atlanta was a deep south segregated city. Uh, my, and, and students in those black colleges were just beginning to break out of their captivity. Uh, captivity, not, uh, a captivity joined in by the white power structure of Atlanta and the administrators of the black college. A kind of tacit agreement between the power structure of the city and the administrators of the college. The tacit agreement being, uh, we will let you have your little Negro college <coughs> and educate young black women to serve the black community as social workers and teachers, maybe even a doctor or a lawyer. Uh, but in return, stay where you are. Stay within the walls of the campus. There was a wall, in fact, around the campus. There was, in fact, barbed wire around the campus. Uh, and there was, it was that, that kind of uh, enclosure and it looked, and this is why you have to be very careful how things look on the surface, it looked as if this situation was frozen in time and nothing would change. Everybody was going through the, the, uh, their daily lives, regularized, controlled. Uh, this law and order, this is the way it was going to be. 
And then in 1960, all hell broke loose. Then suddenly, suddenly, and you know, the exact process by which this takes place is itself complicated, somewhat mysterious, but not totally. But somebody starts something, and then somebody takes it up. Somebody gets, somebody starts something, and then somebody else who's been waiting, waiting, waiting for a moment to, to join in uh, decides, yes, maybe, maybe now I can do it because somebody else has done it, and then they do it, and then somebody else does, and then somebody else does it. That, that wasn't planned. There was no grand strategy. Martin Luther King and nobody sat down in a room and said, this is how the civil rights movement is going to develop. And so my students, from being the most polite, obedient, organized, controlled students on this very controlled campus, suddenly leaped over the wall and went into the city and sat in the restaurants and public places and uh, demanded that racial segregation be ended. So this was going on. And one day some students came to my house and we, were, we lived on, on the campus of Spelman College and uh, there were a few white faculty people, mostly a black faculty, an all-black college. And uh, a few students came to my house and said, we're going downtown uh, to distribute leaflets on Peachtree Street uh, against racial segregation in the city of Atlanta. You teach constitutional law. What is our constitutional right to do this? Teachers very often have experiences like this, you know. Makes us feel godlike. You know. <laughs> students come to us and say, you are the teacher. You teach this subject. You know. Tell us. You know. Uh, well, I suppose if it had been in a classroom, I would have been tempted to do the sort of ordinary, regular thing. Oh, do you have a right to, to distribute leaflets on a public street? Of course. There's a, there are a lot of rights in the Constitution and, and parts of the First Amendment which are, are, have not been clearly defined, really, by the courts. But if there's any right in the Constitution which has been clearly defined by the courts, it is the right to distribute leaflets on a public street. And the whole series of decisions establishing the right of people to distribute leaflets on the street. And so I suppose if I were in a classroom situation, they asked me, I might have been tempted to give that stupid answer. Yes, you have a perfect right to go down Peachtree Street, but I've been living in the South, and I've been living in this community, and going through this, and I, I couldn't say that without interjecting a note of reality. And the note of reality is, yes, you have a constitutional right technically to do that. But if you go downtown and start distributing leaflets on the street, and I wasn't urging them not to, I was just trying to tell them what might happen. A policeman may come over to you, because the policemen in Atlanta are not accustomed to black students showing up on Peachtree Street distributing leaflets. And policemen are easily rattled. <laughs> and the policeman seeing you distributing these leaflets on the street may say to you, leave, or something like that. You know. What do you do then? Well, you, you say, sir, uh, I have a constitutional right to do this. Do you know the case of Marsh versus Alabama? <laughs> well, at that point, there is the perfect situation for deciding when is a right a right or not a right. On your side, the student's side, you have the Constitution of the United States, the Supreme Court of the United States. What could be more powerful than that? On the policeman's side, all he has is his club, his gun. 
power determines the right of free speech. I, I couldn't say it more clearly than that. Your right of free speech does not depend on the First Amendment or on what the Supreme Court has said lately. Your right of free speech depends on who in the immediate situation has the power to decide if you have free speech. The policeman on the street has the power. Oh yes, you can say, yeah, but if I'm arrested, I'll just, and I then have to show up in court, I'll explain to the judge that this policeman does not understand the constant. You will find the judge doesn't understand. You will find that local judges may not pay attention to the Constitution. I saw this again and again throughout the South. It happens all the time. Yes, eventually, maybe six years from now, a hundred thousand dollars later, maybe you will get your case after you've spent time in jail and all that money, your, your case will come up before the Supreme Court. And then maybe the Supreme Court will rule in your favor and you will be given retroactive free speech. That will do you a lot of good. Except that the very next day after the Supreme Court has rendered its decision on your behalf, if somebody else goes out on the same street to distribute a leaflet and is arrested again, it won't matter that the Supreme Court has made its decision the day before. Power decides. And people in various situations have learned that. Uh, students in school. The rights of students in school are determined by the people who have the power. The teacher in the classroom, the administrator in, in the school situation. The censor of the student newspaper. Now I know in this case the Supreme Court decided a few years ago that in fact students' newspapers may be censored by school authorities. You would say, hey, what about the First Amendment? Well, you find when you read the history of Supreme Court decisions on the Bill of Rights, the First Amendment isn't what it's cracked up to be. That there are all sorts of situations where the court has decided that although, the, it, although it seems like an absolute statement, Congress shall make no law, etc., no. The school is one of them. You're just a high school student. You're not a real adult human being. There's certain special categories of people who, for whom the First Amendment really doesn't apply. Another one is GIs. Well, you're not a high school student anymore. You're a grown-up person, grown up enough to, to serve in the military, to die if necessary. You're a grown-up person, but you're in the military. You don't have the Constitution, you don't have the First Amendment on your side. Uh, this, during the Vietnam War, uh, Supreme Court decisions, Rehnquist, as an associate justice, uh, practicing to be chief justice, uh, made this clear. If you're in the military, no, military discipline comes before freedom of speech. If you're a prisoner in prison, you don't have freedom of speech. Your mail is subject to censorship. You uh, realities, uh, the reality of power. The courtroom is not a place where you have freedom of speech. This is odd. The courtroom. This is not a totalitarian state. This is democracy. We have due process. We have judges. We have juries. We have contending attorneys. We have procedures. It looks good. But the courtroom is not a democratic place. If you become a defendant in a trial, you will learn that. The judge is all-powerful. A courtroom is a tyranny. The judge decides what questions may be asked and what questions may not be asked. The judge decides what witnesses may be called and what witnesses may not be called. What evidence may be produced, what evidence may not be produced. Who may speak, who may not speak. And you, the defendant, being represented by a court-appointed lawyer because you don't have the money, or by any lawyer. At a certain point, you feel that you're in a Kafkaesque situation, that this is unreal, that, that the things that are, the words that are swirling about you have no relationship to the reality of your situation, and you want to say something. You want to stand up in the courtroom and say, hey, stop this, I want to tell you, 
I want to tell you it from my point of view. The judge says, sit down. You are represented by attorney. Contempt of court and all of that. Freedom of speech. And what about a work situation? There's nothing in the Constitution that gives you a right to speak freely on the job. The First Amendment says Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech. It doesn't say General Motors may make no law abridging the freedom of speech. It doesn't say your boss may not abridge your freedom of speech. It doesn't protect you. For a long time, the Constitution did not protect you against abuse of your freedom of speech by state governments or local governments because the words were Congress shall make no law, but the states could make a law. In fact, the, during slavery days, uh, states like Georgia made Florida, Louisiana, pass the laws, uh, not allowing people to write anti-slavery, distribute anti-slavery literature. In some cases, on the penalty of death, states could do whatever they wanted to. It wasn't until the 1920s, 30s, that the, the First Amendment, by the addition of the, by sort of putting it together with the 14th Amendment, was made to apply to state governments. However, it still didn't apply and still doesn't apply to private institutions. Now, you're at a state university. So presumably, technically, legally, if your freedom of speech is interfered with by officials at a state university, you have some constitutional right, that is technically. Before you, you get it approved, all sorts of things may happen to you. But in a private institution like Boston University, where I taught for many years, no constitutional protection. And in fact, uh, student distributing leaflets in the outside the Board of Trustees meeting, that's a very dangerous thing to distribute leaflets outside a meeting of the Board of Trustees. Uh, security police come and whisk the student away. Uh, student comes back, he is suspended for a semester for distributing leaflets outside of Board of Trustees meeting. You know. Uh, that's the reality of power and law. Uh, so most free speech situations are settled out of court. That is, you're fooling yourself if you try to determine your right to free speech by reading Supreme Court decisions. Very few cases come before the Supreme Court. Most cases, of, most problems of free speech are settled by the authorities in a given situation, uh, by whoever has the power. Well, that suggests something to you, I suppose, that if you want free speech, you better develop power. If you can't develop the power individually, you'll have to do develop it collectively. Uh, that's what movements are about. Movements uh, assemble the power of individuals who don't have the legal power and, and create a, a power of citizens to demand their right of free speech, insist on their right of free speech, uh, what, whatever the employer says or whatever the police say or whatever the authorities say. That's what movements are about. So, um, as I say, most situations of free speech settle out of court, and in those rare situations when, where they get into court, you cannot depend on the Supreme Court. Uh, you, you can draw up, and civil libertarians are, pro, are fond of doing this, because civil libertarians love statements by the Supreme Court on behalf of free speech. When they find them, they single them out and they hold them up saying, look what the Supreme Court said in West Virginia versus Barnett. And, and look what they said in Hague versus CIO. And, because there have been some glowing statements made by the Supreme Court. And you can draw up a list of cases in which the Supreme Court made inspiring statements about the right of free speech. And then you can draw up another list on the other side of the board of uh, those cases in which the Supreme Court has denied free speech. Where does that leave the citizen? Uncertain. 
in court, out of court, uh, in court, uh, well, just recently, right, that decision by the Supreme Court approving the executive order that doctors may not give abortion advice in, uh, you know, situations where federal funding involved. Doctors may not speak <laughs> about that. Uh, affirmed by the Supreme Court. And by the way, it's not just this Supreme Court. Uh, liberals have gotten all excited about, about how conservative the Supreme Court is, and of course it's, it's true. <laughs> it's an, we have a, a Supreme Court of nine conservatives. I mean, the only reason somebody like Blackman or Stevens looks liberal, <laughs> they never were, you see, they never were white. Wizard white? Liberal? No, they were never. Li but suddenly, against Rehnquist and Scalia and Kennedy and Souter and Thomas, uh, they, yeah, they all look liberal, these few people. But actually, there were nine conservatives on the Supreme Court. Seven conservative white men. One conservative woman. One conservative black. All in the interests of racial e sexual equality, I guess. Uh, but, but the social struggles of our time are not going to be won uh, before the Supreme Court. And those people who depended on a liberal Supreme Court were making a great mistake. Uh, they were reneging on their own responsibility to create an atmosphere in the country in which people gain their rights and not depend on whoever happens to be sitting on the Supreme Court because that won't matter. The Supreme Court can declare a right and the right won't exist because the reality won't be there for it. The Supreme Court declared school segregation illegal in Brown versus Board of Education in 1954 and school segregation persisted for years and years and years. Still does. Uh, well, that's, that's just one problem. <laughs> one basic problem in connection with freedom of speech, the problem of power. Uh, at this point, I take out my watch to pretend that I care. <laughs> <laughs> Speakers really don't care. <laughs> like the audience to think they're concerned about the, your lives and what you have to do. And no, we don't care at all. <laughs> There are, there are some other problems besides the problem of power. There's a problem of just government harassment, of government surveillance, government interference with freedom of speech. I'm talking about the FBI and the CIA. Uh, I'm talking about the fact that uh, well, it becomes known that the FBI, if it isn't known to you, you will know as soon as you do something a little, you know, out of the way, uh, somebody may visit your neighbor and ask about you. Somebody may visit your employer and ask about you. That's what the FBI has done as a matter, that's its job as a matter of course, you know. Uh, and so they, they, the FBI developed this, this list, all these index cards, 500,000 Americans on index cards. You don't know if you're on there and you don't know even if it's only 500,000, you don't, right? Once you have a secret police, you don't, and then the secret police come forward and say, yeah, we, we're, oh, okay, we're going to come clean. This is what we have. But it's their nature not to tell all that they have. You know, just as, you know, it's sort of, it was sort of silly for, for the people to question Gates when he was uh, being tested to see if he was, you know, the proper director for the CIA, and they wanted to determine if he was honest. <laughs> so the most ridiculous notion. <laughs> <laughs> to have somebody who's head of the CIA who tells the truth. Uh, but no, that's their job, to, uh, to do things secretly and to take names secretly. And, and, you may, and even after the FBI came, after they were exposed for having this program, this COINTEL, counterintelligence program where they 
did all sorts of things, you know, le illegally, wiretapped illegally, broke into people's homes illegally, sent uh, anonymous letters so that people would lose their jobs, sent letters to, to anonymously to Martin Luther King suggesting that he commit suicide, or, you know, real, the, this program, the whole program that they had, the FBI, and then they, they said, okay, well, no more of this stuff. They were exposed, there's a big investigation report by the church committee of the Senate. A few years after they say no more of this stuff, it turns out that they are uh, accumulating names of people who belong to organizations that are interested in Central America.